Section 8.8 .8, Power Series Part 2. Uh, we'll call this video Building Power Series from Other Power Series. So what we're going to do is use a combination of techniques that we learned in the last video to derive power series for functions from ones that we already know. And so we're going to go through a series of examples to illustrate these techniques. Uh, so let's start with probably the most basic power series there is, which is the series n equals 0 to infinity x to the n. And remember, power series have the general form n equals 0 to infinity cn x to the n. They're centered at 0, so this is definitely a power series centered at 0. And notice for this power series, I'm making the identification that c sub n is equal to 1 for each term in this power series because of the coefficient of 1 that's sitting right there in front of x to the n. All right, now, where have we seen this series before? Well, I should recognize that that's really just this guy. It's 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on. And of course, I recognize that that's really just a basic geometric series. Instead of 1 plus r plus r squared plus r cubed and so on, I'm just using the variable x now. And I know that this sums to 1 over 1 minus x, provided the absolute value of x is less than 1. That is, if the absolute value of x is less than 1, I know that I have convergence. And the sum of this infinite series is 1 over 1 minus x. All right, so let's think about what that says. It says that 1 over 1 minus x is represented by the power series n equals 0 to infinity x to the n. And that means if I do anything to this function, let's say to try and create a new function, I would do the same thing to the other side of the equation, which would mean any sort of algebraic manipulation or derivative or integral that I could apply to the left side of the equation would also be applied to the right. Okay, so for example, that says if I wanted to take the derivative of both sides of this equation, which would look like this, well, what would the right side look like? I know that would be term by term differentiation, and I would get the series n equals 1 to infinity nx to the n minus 1 because, of course, I am just using the power rule on each term, pulling down n and then subtracting 1 from the power. Okay, what would the derivative of the left side be? It would be just the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x, which, if you check that, that's 1 over 1 minus x squared. So if you see what we've done here, it's, it's a pretty simple idea. I've taken a known power series for a simple function, and I have derived the power series for a different function by simply taking the derivative of the power series for 1 over 1 minus x, which is, again, a basic one I know because it's just a geometric. In other words, now I have the power series for the function 1 over 1 minus x squared. And we're saying that is, again, n equals 1 to infinity uh, n x to the n minus 1. What was the interval of convergence for the 1 over 1 minus x series that we started with? Well, we said it was all x such that the absolute value of x was less than 1. In other words, it was the open interval of convergence negative 1 to 1. Okay, we know what happens when we take derivatives or integrate power series the endpoints or convergence at the endpoints may be affected. Okay, what that means is I would want to check this series at x equals negative 1 and x equals 1 to see if the convergence at negative 1 or 1 has been affected. Well, when x is negative 1, what does this power series give me? 
it simply gives me n equals 1 to infinity n times negative 1 to the n minus 1. And if x equals 1, it would just be n equals 1 to infinity n times 1 to the n minus 1, which would just be 1. Okay, it should be clear in looking at both of those series that both of these series diverge. Okay, very simply why? If I apply the nth term test to both of these series, I can see that the limit as n goes to infinity of n is clearly not zero. So that means this series doesn't converge. And the limit as n goes to infinity of n times negative 1 to the n minus 1 uh, doesn't exist. Okay, why? Because n gets bigger and bigger, but the negative 1 to the n minus 1 causes alternating terms. So what that means is these terms move further and further away from 0 the bigger n gets. Uh, I'm really diverging towards alternately positive infinity and negative infinity. But that clearly means limit is not 0. Therefore, this series also diverges. In other words, same interval of convergence I started with. Okay, so this is a basic example that shows us uh, if we're trying to find a power series for something like 1 over 1 minus x squared, if I can be clever enough to notice that that's the derivative of something like 1 over y minus x, which has a very simple power series, then it's simple to find the power series for 1 over 1 minus x squared. I just take the derivative. Okay, here's another important example. Let's look at the series n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. Okay, if I write out a few terms of this series, what does that look like? Uh, when n is 0, I would get 1. When n is 1, I would get x over 1. When n is 2, I would get x squared over 2 factorial, which is x squared over 2. When n is 3, I would get x cubed over 3 factorial, which is 6. When x is 4, I would get x to the 4th over 4 factorial, which is 24. And that gets me the first five terms, and so I can see what the pattern is. Okay, this really is a super important example, and so we're going to uh, add this to our list right now. If this is f of x, so let me call this f of x, let's look at what the derivative is. Okay, how would the derivative work? Again, I would just differentiate term by term, so that means using the power rule. That means I pull the n down, the power becomes n minus 1, n factorial is just a constant with respect to x, so that stays in the denominator. I would re-index starting at 1. Uh, again, that's just the custom because when I pulled this n down, then I'm going to omit the term when n equals 0 because that would just make this entire term 0. All right, so there's my derivative. Okay, now that I've written it that way, let's do a quick bit of re-indexing. Let's re-index it so that I can start this at 0 again in such a way that when n is 0, I don't have a 0 term. Okay, I'm going to do that the same way we always do re-indexing. I'm going to look at that n equals 1 equation, and I'm going to replace n with basically n plus 1, which will turn that equation into n equals 0. In other words, I am replacing all of the n's in my series by n plus 1's. Okay, that would get me n equals 0 to infinity. This n would change to n plus 1. Okay, what would this one change to? It would change to x to the n, and the bottom would change to n plus 1 factorial. Okay, make sure you can see what I did there with the re-indexing. And what happens when I divide n plus 1 
by n plus 1 factorial, well, what I get there is 1 over n factorial, which means this becomes n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. And surprise, surprise, this series is the same one we started out with up here. In other words, when we took the derivative of this f function, we got the same function back. And we know the only function generally that will do that is f of x equals c e to the x. Of course, when c is 0, uh, f of x equals 0 is the other basic function whose derivative is itself. But if c is not 0, we know the only function that's its own that it is, is its own derivative is the basic exponential function. All right, so what that means is c e to the x is the function that's represented by n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. Now, as usual, we can normally figure out what these sorts of constants are if we make a good choice for x, and the choice I'm going to make is x equals 0. If you remember that this series is actually 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 and so on, then you can see that when I evaluate that function at 0, the only thing that's going to be left is 1. So what that tells me is c e to the x is equal to 1, and of course I have substituted 0 for x right there, which means of course that c is equal to 1. And so what we've just derived here is the famous power series centered at 0 for the basic e to the x exponential function. And of all the power series that we're going to talk about, this one may very well be the most important. So we'll see this many, many times. Okay, let's insert an application of the exponential function here and the power series for it, uh, which is a pretty typical and important application. So again, I know that e to the x is now given by the power series n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. And so if I asked, for example, what is e to the minus 1? Well, again, I'm viewing the right side of that equation as a function which I can evaluate at negative 1. If I did so, I would get n equals 0 to infinity negative 1 to the n over n factorial. And so that says what? That e to the minus 1 is equal to, okay, let's evaluate a few terms. If n is 0, then of course I get 1. If n is 1, I get minus 1. I actually get minus 1 over 1 factorial. Okay, what about when n is 2? The top will be negative 1 squared, which is 1. The bottom will be 2 factorial, which is 2, so that would be 1 half. Okay, what's the next term? The next term would be when n is 3, which would be negative 1 cubed over 3 factorial. Plus, and I can see now, of course, that this part is just going to make the terms alternate in sign. Always with a plus or minus 1 in the numerator, and then the denominators are just factorials. So, of course, this one was 2 factorial. This one is 3 factorial. So now I know the next one should be 1 over 4 factorial minus 1 over 5 factorial plus 1 over 6 factorial minus... 1 over 7 factorial, and so on, repeating the pattern. Okay, suppose I asked you to use this power series to approximate the value of e to the minus 1 accurate to three decimal places.
Okay, we'll recall from uh, what we know about approximation that generally what's meant when I say approximate the value of a number accurate to three decimal places, that's really code for I want the error in the approximation to be less than 0 0.0005. And I'll let you think about why that's true and of course it has to do with rounding. I know that if I'm going to be accurate to three decimal places I have to look at what's happening in that fourth decimal place and that determines whether I'm going to stay at the same third digit or round that digit up. And if you look at both possibilities it turns out that the maximum possible error in either case uh, cannot exceed 0 .0005. In other words if we're approximating to three decimal places we're saying three zeros and then a five and the next decimal place. All right, now let's take what we wrote down up here, which are the first several terms of e to the minus one, and let's write out what those look like as decimals. So of course we had one minus one, we said plus one half, so let's say plus 0.5, minus one sixth, which is point one six six. Well, it's point one six repeating, but since we want accuracy to three decimal places, let's round this to four decimal places. Um, plus one twenty fourth, which if you check that in your calculator, that's point oh four one seven. Minus one over one hundred twenty, which is. 0.0083 if rounded to four decimal places plus 1 over 720 which is 0 0.0014 minus 1 over 5040 which when rounded to four decimal places is 0 0.0001 All right, now, you should already know where I'm going with this. What have we talked about before that allows us to pinpoint the maximum possible error for a numerical series? There's only one kind of series we've talked about that has a criterion like that, and it was the alternating series. Okay, this is definitely a convergent alternating series. Uh, we didn't write it down before, but if we check the interval of convergence for this, it's actually all real numbers, so the radius of convergence is infinity. Okay, that means it certainly converges for negative 1. Okay, if it converges, then the question is, if I want approximation accurate to three decimal places, it's only a matter of how many terms do I need to get that. And we remember our theorem back in the section on alternating series said that we need to go out to at least as many terms so that the next term has an absolute value less than the error we want. All right, now we said accuracy to three decimal places means that we want the error to be no greater than 0 0.0005. What's the first term down here where I've written these decimal numbers that's less than 0 0.0005? It's this one. Okay, if that's the first term that's less than 0 0.0005, and actually that's not true, I'm pointing to the wrong one. I think it's actually this one, isn't it? That's the first one that's less than 0 0.0005, three zeros and then something less than five. Okay, so what does our alternating series theorem on approximation say? it says that if I keep all of the terms up to that, then that will be an approximation that will be good to at least three decimal places. And so just copying what we had above, that was minus one sixth plus one twenty fourth minus one over twenty plus 1 over 720, which was the point zero zero one four, And since the next term in the series has an absolute value less than the maximum error I'm shooting for, 
then I'll stop there and I'll keep that partial sum of all the terms that came before it. All right, now I'm not going to uh, write down the value here. I haven't done it ahead of time, but if I fed this into the calculator and then I compared with what the calculator would spit out, let's say out to nine or ten decimal places for e to the minus one, I would see that the error between those two would be less than 0 0.0005. All right, so if you run into questions in the homework or in my open math where they're asking you something about how many terms in a power series are necessary to approximate something, uh, it's very likely that that power series is going to end up being an alternating series. And if it is, you can always fall back on that alternating series theorem that said, I just need to make sure that I have enough terms so that the next term has an error less than what I want. And for some reason, I keep trying to erase that. And since that's the first term that has an error less than the error I prescribed up here, I want to keep all the terms that came before it. So everything up through the 0 0.0014, which was everything up through the 100 over 720. Okay, so that's a typical application of alternating series, and obviously that springs right from this power series where I'm just evaluating at a particular value of x. So I could use this kind of analysis to approximate anything, e to the minus 1, e to the minus 2, e to the 0.7. I could do any of those approximations just by looking for the first term whose absolute value is less than the given error, which would be something given in the problem. Okay, let's get back to building series using various techniques. So here's another example to give us a, a tool to think about. Let's look at the series 1 over 1 plus x. And this is going to end up being another standard power series. So when I say standard, there is a list, um, I believe it's in section 8.10, that has a list of very common power series that we use a lot. And of course the power series that for e to the x is in there. Uh, the power series for 1 over 1 minus x is in there. Uh, this power series will also be in there. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. Um, this looks sort of like the formula for a geometric series, except I know the formula for a geometric series is 1 over 1 minus x, not 1 plus x. Okay, so we can do algebraic manipulation on these, and I'm going to do a couple more examples like this shortly. I can simply change this to 1 over 1 minus a minus x. And if I do that, this definitely looks like 1 over 1 minus r now, where I've made my common ratio minus x. And we know that the formula for 1 over 1 minus r is the series n equals 0 to infinity r to the n. Notice in this case, that means that 1 over 1 minus minus x would be n equals 0 to infinity r, which is actually the minus x to the n, so that my r is actually the minus x. So what this says is 1 over 1 plus x is actually a geometric series, and it is a geometric series in which the terms alternate in sign. And notice I am just separating that negative x to the n into the negative 1 to the n part and the x to the n part. And what I'm emphasizing there is that that c sub n coefficient that we're always talking about is negative 1 to the n. It's just a factor that makes this alternate. In other words, what is the series for 1 over 1 plus x? Well, if I write out a few terms, first I would look at the term when n equals 0, and that would be 1. When n is 1, I would get minus x. When n is 2, I would get plus x squared. When n is 3, I'd get minus x cubed. And now I see that all of the odd power terms are negative, 
and all the even powered terms are positive. So it's that same geometric series we did before for 1 over 1 minus x, except now I have alternating signs. All the odd powered terms are negatives. All right, now, when you look at this function, um, if you were thinking about ways that you could build other functions from that, and this is really something it would be best to... Uh, sort of come to on your own and so if I was sitting in front of you in class we'd talk about this for a few minutes on the board but since we're in a video here uh, we'll jump right to it if you look at this function I think it would be reasonable after looking at it a minute to realize that 1 over 1 plus x has an antiderivative of ln 1 plus x and so that makes me think well, if I can take the antiderivative of 1 over 1 minus x and get ln of absolute value 1 plus x, that means ln of 1 plus x has to be the antiderivative of this power series, which is this guy, n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the n. Alright, so now we're talking about how to build a series from another one by taking an antiderivative. And again, my cue was when I saw this function, I sort of think about what happens if I take derivatives or integrals, and immediately I stumble on the fact that taking an antiderivative gets me something totally different, a logarithm. So what is ln of 1 plus x? Well, when I integrate the right side, I know integrating a power series means that I just integrate term by term. And I do it by just using the power rule. So when I integrate, I'm going to get negative 1 to the n, x to the n plus 1, divided by n plus 1. Don't forget the plus c, because this is an indefinite integral. All right, now... Same old game we always play. If I take the antiderivative of a function, and now on the right side of the equation I have some power series plus an arbitrary constant, is there a way I can figure out a particular value for that constant? And we know again the game is to make a judicious choice for the x over here. And usually we choose things like x equals 0, x equals 1. And in this case, it's pretty obvious, I think, that if I choose x equals 0, the right side of this equation is ln 1, which is 0. Now, if I write out what the other side is, let's write a few terms. And by the way, if you think about what the derivative, or what the, I'm sorry, what the terms are going to look like in this series, aren't they just going to be the antiderivatives of the terms in this series? Which means the first term should be x, because that's the antiderivative there, minus x squared over 2. Now let's see, if n is 1 in this series right here, that would give me what in my formula? Negative 1 to the 1, which would be negative, times x to the 1 plus 1, which would be x squared over 1 plus 1, which would be 2. So what I'm emphasizing there is I can generate the terms for this antiderivative from this formula, or I can get them from this expansion I did up here just by integrating term by term, just using power rules. Okay, if I continue, what do I get for the next few terms? If I go to the next one, it should be x cubed over 3 minus x to the 4 over 4 plus x to the 5 over 5 minus dot 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 plus c. And let me back up here a second. So that's what ln of 1 plus x is but we're talking about evaluating at x equals 0. So when I do that, the left side becomes ln of 1, which is 0. What's the other side? Well, what happens when you plug 0 into 
all of these terms in this power series expansion. Well, all of the x terms zero out, and what you're left with will be only the constant c. Okay, so what does that tell us? Simply that c must be zero. Okay, so what we've derived here is another basic formula. The ln of 1 plus x is equal to the series n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. And the plus c has turned out to be plus 0. Uh, what is the interval of convergence for this? I'll leave it for you to determine that the interval of convergence is the interval negative 1 to 1, 1 included, negative 1 not included. All right, how do I know, for starters, that the open interval has to at least be negative 1 to 1? Well, if I go back up here to the function we started with, which was this geometric series, what's the interval of convergence for that geometric series? Well, it's whatever interval makes the absolute value of negative x less than 1, which is the same thing as absolute value of x less than 1, which is negative 1 to 1. Okay, in our last video, what did we say about that open interval of convergence when we try to take a derivative or an antiderivative of that power series? It does not change the basic open interval of convergence. That means if this series I started with converged on the open interval negative 1 to 1, I know that the antiderivative is also going to converge at least on that open interval. Okay, but I would still need to check the endpoints, and I'll leave that part for you to check. Uh, suffice it to say, you are going to gain convergence at x equals 1 when you take this antiderivative. And so now we see another example of the interval of convergence being altered at the endpoints when you take either an antiderivative or a derivative. Okay, now if you saw what we were after in that last example, then you should know exactly where I'm going with this next one. What's the first thing you think about in this class when you see 1 over 1 plus x squared? I think the first thing that pops into your head is that the antiderivative of that is tan inverse of x. Okay, so the question is, could I find a power series for 1 over 1 plus x squared? Because if I could, I could anti-differentiate that power series and come up with a power series for tan inverse. All right, what did we do when we had 1 over 1 plus x? We did a little plus minus manipulation to make this look like 1 over 1 minus something. That way I could interpret this as a geometric series. Okay, I can do that same thing here. I can certainly look at this as 1 over 1 minus a minus x squared. So it's the same game that we played in the last example. And now if this guy is playing the role of the R, I know that this basic geometric series should be n equals 0 to infinity, negative x squared to the n. So what that says is 1 over 1 plus x squared will converge to n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n on whatever the interval of convergence is for this series. Well, what is the interval of convergence for this series? It's wherever the absolute value of r is less than 1, and in this case our r was negative x squared. Well, that's just asking when is x squared less than 1. And that, again, is the open interval negative 1 to 1. So what we've established is 1 over 1 plus x squared. I can get to the value of that function with this power series on the right, and that power series will converge to the value 1 over 1 plus x squared for all x values in the interval negative 1 to 1. 
All right, now we know where we're going with this. We're saying that we can take the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared by simply taking the antiderivative of its power series. Okay, of course, this side, the left side, should be tan inverse of x. There will be a plus c, but I'll just write that on the right side of the equation after we take the antiderivative. All right, how do I anti-differentiate this power series on the right? Again, I just take the antiderivative term by term, which means I'm going to use the power rule right there. And it looks like I got ahead of myself. I think this should just be 2n here because that's what we had up here. But of course, why did I write plus 1 there? Because I know that when I apply the power rule, this will become a plus 1, which means I'm going to end up with n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1. I see I got sloppy here and dropped the n also. Let's uh, clean up my mess. So I'm copying down what I had here, here, and now I'm going to take the antiderivative, which means I have negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1, divided by 2n plus 1, plus c. And that says what? That tan inverse of x equals, now what do I get when I write out a few terms? Well, I can see when n equals 0, negative 1 to the n is just going to be 1. I'll have x to the 2 times 0 plus 1, which would be x, over 2 times 0 plus 1. That'd be x over 1. So that's x. What about when n was 1? When n is 1, which will be the second term in this series, I get minus x cubed, because that's what this is going to be when n is 1 over 3. The next one's going to be a plus because the next one's going to be when n is 2. When n is 2, this part's positive 1. This part will be 5. This part will also be 5. So that would be x to the fifth over 5. And I think we've established enough or written down enough terms to establish the pattern. It's going to be minus x to the 7th over 7 plus x to the 9 over 9 minus x to the 11 over 11 and so on with some arbitrary constant term at the end. And you should be able to tell right away what that constant is. If x is 0, we know that tan inverse of 0 will be 0. And we know every other term on the other side of the equation has at least an x in it which means every one of those terms in the power series will zero out, and the only thing that's left will be the c. c is zero again. This says that tan inverse x has a power series n equals zero to infinity, negative one to the n, x to the 2n plus one, over 2n plus one, plus c, but we just determined c is zero. And so now we have another basic power series that you'll see in the list of important power series. And again, we got to it by taking the antiderivative of a very basic series that we know. Okay, again, why did we even think to look at this function? Because when I look at 1 over 1 plus x squared, it's real obvious that it's a geometric series, which is easy for me to write a power series for. And... This particular rational function just happens to be something that has a very simple antiderivative. Okay, so we're looking at some examples here, hopefully that are giving you some ideas about how I can generate power series from other power series by doing simple things like taking derivatives, integrating. Um, let's go back to another application problem. That is something that helps us either approximate the value of a function using a power series, or in this case, it's going to be something that helps us find an antiderivative. And so what I want to look at is the antiderivative of e 
to the minus x squared dx. Now, uh, you probably talked about this particular integral in Calc 1. Um, as we've said before, there are far, far more functions that you can't find elementary antiderivatives for than ones you can. And this is usually one that's cited as an easy to understand example of why you can't find an elementary antiderivative of e to the minus x squared using standard techniques. And in fact, uh, let me refine that statement. There is no elementary antiderivative for e to the minus x squared. What I mean by that is there is no function f of x for which the derivative of f is e to the minus x squared where f of x is built, and I'm just going to loosely say from common functions. And what I mean by that is there is no way to build a function either by algebra or composition out of any of the functions, any of the elementary functions we know. So polynomial, logarithmic, exponential, trigonometric, rational, radical. There's no way to combine those into any basic elementary function whose derivative will be e to the minus x squared. Which means thus far this question or this integral has been beyond our reach. There's just no way to do it. In fact, what I'm telling you is there is no elementary antiderivative. However, could there be a power series for the antiderivative? Well, the answer is yes, if I can find a power series for e to the minus x squared. So that means if I could find a power series for e to the minus x squared, so let's say some n equals 0 to infinity cn x to the n, if it was centered at 0, then I could certainly find a power series for the antiderivative of e to the minus x squared by simply integrating this series term by term. And this is a very standard technique and approximation of functions. Even when we can't find an actual elementary antiderivative for a function, if we can find a power series for this function, then we can certainly find a power series formula for the antiderivative of that function. Okay, but again, this hinges on what? We need a power series for e to the minus x squared. Okay, that part's easy. We already know the power series for e to the x. We said it was n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. Okay, think back to the last video. What are the techniques at our disposal for building functions or building power series out of other power series? We can take derivatives, we can integrate, but if you remember at the end of that video, I talked about how we could do function compositions. If you remember, we said if we knew a power series for a function, we could build the power series for f of kx, for f of x to the k, and then we also talked about how we could add two power series together to generate a third one. Well, notice what e to the minus x squared is. If f of x is e to the x, then of course we are just looking at f of negative x squared, which of course is a combination of these two. I'm using the k equals 2 power, but I'm also using a k equals negative 1 to put a negative 1 in front of that x squared. In other words, if this is, let's say, e to the blank equals the series of blank to the n over n factorial, we're saying we can treat this like a function and simply replace x by negative x squared. And in so doing, we'll also replace the x in our power series by negative x squared. In other words, what is the power series for e to the minus x squared? It's n equals 0 to infinity. Let's say it's negative 1 to the n times x to the 2n over n factorial. And so now we have a power series for e to the minus x squared, which means 
I should be able to come up with a power series for the antiderivative of e to the minus x squared by simply integrating the power series on the right side of the equation. And what's that going to give us? If we integrate that series term by term, then again, we're just going to use the power rule for integration, which means I'm going to end up with my negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1. Notice that that n factorial will still be in the bottom, but there'd also have to be this factor of 2n plus 1 that results from using the power rule. So the antiderivative of e to the minus x squared is definitely this power series plus some additive constant of integration. All right, so this illustrates an, another technique that's, as I said, useful in the theory of approximating functions. Even when I can't find elementary antiderivatives for a function, I may be able to find power series for the antiderivatives of those functions. And here's a good example of how we did that. Um, just as an example of how I might apply this, um, I won't go through all the calculations, but I'll just say down here in red, if I wanted to evaluate something like, let's say, 0 to 1 half e to the minus x squared dx, well, I had no way to do this before since I wasn't able to find an antiderivative of e to the minus x squared other than using something like Simpson's rule or the trapezoidal rule. Well, as we'll see in the next few sections, uh, those rules are really just tweaked versions of power series or parts of power series. So really those rules you learned back in Calc 1 are sort of special cases of what we're doing when we use power series to approximate things. So what I could say over here is the integral 0 to 1 half e to the minus x squared should be equal to what? Well, if I call this, let's just give this the name g of x, do you see that I would need to do g of 1 half minus g of 0? Because the thing I just circled on the right is the antiderivative. And so once I find the antiderivative, I should just use my fundamental theorem of calculus and plug in these two values and subtract. <clears throat> Notice that when you do that, since this C is contained in both this antiderivative and this antiderivative, the C is going to go away. It will disappear when you subtract these two. All right, so again, I don't want to go through all of the calculations here, but if I wrote out a few terms in this series, let's see if we can say what e to the minus x squared dx is. Uh, what's our first term? It would be when n is 0. If I plug 0 in here, I'm going to get 1 x to the 1 over 0 factorial, which is 1, times 1. So it looks like I'm going to get 1x. OK, what's the next term? It would be when n is 1. When n is 1, this would be negative 1. This would be x cubed. This would be 1 factorial, which is 1. This guy here would be 3 again. So that means I'd have negative x cubed over 3. OK, if I calculated a few more, I think you can probably guess the pattern. Well, maybe not. Let's be careful. What's the next one? It would be when n is 2. OK, when n is 2, let's see, this would be positive 1 again. This would be x to the fifth. This would also be a 5. What would this one be? That would be 2 factorial, which would be 2, which means I will get a plus x to the 5. But the denominator isn't just 5. It's 2 times 5 because of that n factorial, which means there's a 10 there. If I did another one, I'll let you verify this for yourself. 
The next one would be x to the 7th over 42. That would be a negative term. The next one would be plus x to the 9th over 216. Uh, plus dot dot dot. Uh, there would be that c there, but since I'm going to evaluate at these two numbers and subtract, I know the c goes away. Now, question. What happens, I guess I'm going to do a little bit more of this than I, than I said. What's this guy going to be? Well, if I plug 0 into this series, you should see that since every term has at least x to the first, that this g of 0 is just going to be 0. Okay, that means the value of this integral from 0 to 1 half is just the value of this power series evaluated at 1 half itself. In other words, it should be 1 half minus 1 half cubed over 8, which would be minus 1 over 24, plus 1 half to the fifth, which would be 1 over 32, divided by 10, which would be 1 over 320. Um, and I've calculated the next couple. Well, I actually calculated just the next one. You can check this for yourself. I got 1 over 5,376. And that would be this term. And then, of course, there's plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, again, what do I have there? An alternating series. And I know that if I was looking for a certain accuracy, I would just have to go out to the first term that guaranteed me an error less than the accuracy that was desired. And so, for example, uh, let me just type this in here. What is 1 divided by 320? 1 divided by 320 is point zero zero three one two five. Okay, that means what? If I approximated the value of this integral by just using the first two terms, I know the error in that approximation would be less than point zero zero three one two five, which is a very good approximation for only using the first two terms in the power series. Okay, what is, as long as we're asking, what is that 1 over 5,376? I get 0 0.0009, which means if I carried my approximation for this integral, out to the first three terms, the error in just using that partial sum would be no greater than 0 0.0009, which is very good, and that's only using three terms. Okay, for the last couple of examples, I'd like to look at a really basic technique which is really powerful to develop power series. And again, we're going to use geometric series as the springboard. So let's look at this example. I want to look at the function 4 over x plus 2. And what I would like is a power series for this function. And let's say we're going to center at 0. And in the next example, we'll talk about how to build a power series for this function centered at other values other than 0. Now, of course, again, what do we mean by centering? We mean we're changing the center of the interval of convergence for this series. So right now, we're talking about building a power series for this function such that whatever the interval of convergence is we come up with, the center is at zero. Could I build another power series for this same function where the center for that power series is one? The answer is yes, but as you'll see here in this section and especially in the next, those two power series will be completely different. When I change where the center is, it changes everything about the power series. 
All right, in this case, let's just go for a power series centered at zero. So this is a standard technique for developing power series from geometric series. So the first thing I'm going to do is write that as 4 over 2 plus x. And you should see where I'm going with this. I am trying to steer this towards something that looks like a over 1 minus r. Because I know if I can do that, this is simply the series n equals 0 to infinity a over, or rather, a times r to the n. Now the question is, how can I manipulate a rational function like this and get it to look like this? Well, that's easy, and we've done a little bit of this before. I should probably, in the denominator, factor out a 2 so that I can get the 1 that I want, that is, that 1 right there. But of course, if I factor a 2 out, it's going to change that x term. And in this case, if I put these two together, what I've got there is 2 over 1 plus 1 half x. And again, what I'm doing so far is just trying to get the 1. And I've got that. Okay, what's the only other thing I need to do to use the geometric series formula? I need this plus to be a minus. And we know what the trick is for that. That's easy. I just write this as 1 minus a minus 1 half x. And now this looks like 2 over 1 minus r, where r is equal to negative 1 half x. Okay, that means my power series for this function should be n equals 0 to infinity a, which in this case is just 2, times r to the n, which in this case is negative x over 2 to the n. Okay, we can clean that up a little bit, and we can say that's 2 times negative 1 to the n times x to the n over 2 to the n. And as you'll see in the next section or two, it is customary to break up something like this into its constituent parts, by which I mean the negative, the x, and the 2. And you'll see why that's important in the next section. And that's why I keep doing this in all these examples. And in this case, of course, what does that give me? It actually gives me n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the n, over 2 to the n minus 1. And there is my power series for the series I started with, or the function I started with, which was 4 over 2 plus x. So that was n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the n over 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, let's take this example to look at another technique. We'll just fold this into the same example. So let's say another way to derive this series. And this is a very simple but very powerful technique. And when you see it, of course, it's, it's going to strike you as very obvious, although it may not be something you would have thought to do. So when I look at 4 over 2 plus x, I would normally not think of doing long division because the degree of the denominator is 1 and the degree of the numerator is less than 1, which means this is not usually suitable for long division. Uh, however, if I were to write it out long division style, you've been trained when dividing polynomials to write the largest power term first in your divisor, and then the same thing for the dividend. If there are multiple terms up here, you write them in descending order of powers. Well, in this case, there is only a 4 in there. But I'm actually going to turn these two around, and I'm going to write that as 2 plus x. So I'm going to put the lowest degree term first. so that I have 2 plus x 
divided into 4. All right, now, if you tried to replicate what you normally do when you do long division, what's the first thing you do? Well, you normally start with this first term, which is the highest degree term, except now it's the lowest degree term. Well, 2 does go into 4, so I would say that goes 2 times. I would multiply by the divisor, and of course I would get my 2 times 2, but I would also get that 2 times x, which would give me a plus 2x, and I would subtract, and there would be a remainder this time, except it's going the other way. It would be a larger power instead of a smaller power. Now, if, that, if you see how that happened, then you should understand that if I continue this process, I am only going to create divisors of larger and larger degree, which means unless I divide into something perfectly evenly, this division should continue indefinitely. Okay, so what I mean by that is if we put our 2 back, then what's the next thing I would do? I would divide 2 into this remainder down here, and of course 2 divided into negative 2x goes negative x times. Negative x times 2 is negative 2x. Negative x times x would be negative x squared. I would subtract to get my remainder, and of course I would get positive x squared. Okay, how much does 2 go into x squared? Well, that's the same thing as asking what's x squared divided by 2. And obviously, x squared times, or x squared divided by 2 times 2 is x squared. And then x squared over 2 times x will be x cubed over 2. I would subtract to get my next remainder. And of course when I do that I'm going to get minus x cubed over 2. Okay, what is 2 divided into minus x cubed over 2? Well that's the same thing as asking what's minus x cubed over 2 divided by 2? That's minus x cubed over 4. Obviously, when I multiply negative x cubed over 4 times 2, I get negative x cubed over 2. And then when I multiply negative x cubed over 4 times x, I'll get negative x to the 4th over 4. Then I'll subtract to get the next remainder. It'll be x to the 4 over 4. Let's write one more term up in the quotient. What's 2 divided into x to the 4th over 4? It's x to the 4th over 8. Plus dot dot dot. Because I can see this process is going to continue indefinitely. So what does this long division that we've done say? It says that, changing back to blue ink, 4 divided by 2 plus x should be 2 minus x plus x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 4 plus x to the fourth over 8 continued. Okay, our formula that we came up with up here, that is the one that we got by using the geometric series formula. What does that look like if we write out the first few terms? When n is 0, I'll get 1x over 2 to the minus 1. So 1 times x to the 0 over 2 to the minus 1. That's 1 over 2 to the minus 1. That's 2. And that definitely matches this term. Okay, what about when n is 1? When n is 1, I'll get minus x to the first over 2 to the 1 minus 1, which would be 2 to the 0, which would be 1 which would give me minus x, which seems to match. Let's do one more just to make sure we're getting it. When n is 2 in this series up here, negative 1 squared would give me positive 1 times x to the 2, so x squared. 
over 2 to the 2 minus 1, which would be 2 to the first, which would be 2. So that gives me plus x squared over 2, which is the next term. Totally different technique for generating this power series, but you can see I'm getting the same answer. So long division is a really useful technique, and you'll need to use it in a few problems. Uh, the only thing that's a turnoff for some students is the what they view as the cumbersome nature of doing long division. Well, that may be so, but if you're used to doing long division and you're not troubled by the long division process with polynomials, you won't find this onerous at all. It's, it's a pretty easy process. All right, so a couple different ways to deal with rational functions, which basically lead to geometric series of some form. Okay, what I'd like to look at next is a few more examples of these power series and the tricks for building these power series or geometric series at different centers. So let's look at a few examples. Let's start with this one. I want to find uh, the power series for 1 over x centered at 1. So, of course, if it was centered at 0, it would be a little more basic. Uh, but in this case, I want it centered at 1. Well, let's see. 1 over x. If I'm going to center this at 1, I know I want this function to somehow contain x minus 1. Because I know that when we talk about a power series centered at 1, I know the general form of that power series should be some coefficient times some power of x minus 1. All right, that's easy, and again, we're playing the same old games we've always played of adding and subtracting the same number. So I can clearly see that 1 over x is just 1 over x minus 1 plus 1, which is just 1 over 1 plus x minus 1. Okay, does that look like our usual geometric series form? Well, it does if I change this plus to a minus. And again, we know the trick for that. It's to change that plus to a minus minus. Okay, but notice when I did that, I left the other minus, this one, I left it outside the x minus 1. I want to keep that x minus 1 in that form so that I can see where it goes when I plug it into the geometric series formula. All right, that means this definitely looks like 1 over 1 minus r, where we're saying r is negative x minus 1. So what's the power series for this guy? It should be n equals 0 to infinity, r to the n, which in this case would be negative x minus 1 to the n. But I can see basically there are two essential parts there that I'd like to celebrate or separate. One is the negative 1, that is this part. So we'll just write that as negative 1 to the n. And then there's the other factor, the x minus 1. And there is my power series for 1 over x centered at 1. And notice what we're saying here is the cn, the coefficients for this power series, are just plus or minus 1, alternating as n switches from even to odd. Okay, so that one's not too bad, especially if uh, you grasp pretty easily what I was doing here with our usual little tricks of adding and subtracting 1 and then replacing a plus by a minus minus. Pretty standard tricks. Let's try another one. So I would like this time to find the power series for, let's say, 1 over x plus 3 centered at, let's say, a equals 5. Okay, again, once I see this, 
I know automatically that I want my function to be re-expressed in terms of x minus 5. If the center was at x, or if the center was at minus 5, I'd want to express in terms of x plus 5. Okay, in this case it should be x minus 5. So again, I just sort of uh, do what I need to do to play with my function. Uh, nothing wrong with saying that 1 over x plus 3 is 1 over x minus 5 plus 5 plus 3, which means really it's 1 over 8 plus x minus 5. All right, we've already seen what to do in this case. I know I'd like that to be a 1, which means I should factor out an 8 in the denominator. If you factor out the 8, what's left? 1 plus 1 8 times x minus 5. What's the other thing I need to fix? I need my plus to be a minus. So that would be 1 over 8 times, let's say, 1 minus a minus 1 8 times x minus 5. Okay, now it should be pretty clear that I do have an r right there so that this whole thing looks like 1 8 over 1 minus that r. What's my power series for this function? It should be n equals 0 to infinity 1 8 times r to the n, which is negative 1 8 times x minus 5 to the n. Uh, let's try and get in the habit of writing these in the expanded form. So if I start picking all of this apart, I definitely see a negative 1 to the n. I see an x minus 5 to the n. I also see an 8 to the n, but of course that's going to be in the denominator. Plus, I already had this 8 in the denominator, which means I have the power series n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x minus 5 to the n, over 8 to the n plus 1. Okay, let's try one more. This one's a little trickier. Let's find, let's say, a power series. I won't specify what the center is here. We'll try and come up with uh, whatever reasonable center we can. But I want you to find a power series for the function 1 over x minus 3 times x plus 2. Now, of course, to save us a little time here, I'm sure the first thing you would be thinking about when you look at that is partial fraction expansion. And if you check your partial fractions, you'll find that 1 fifth over x minus 3 minus 1 fifth over x plus 2 is the correct expansion. And I can certainly see that each one of these two is really just a basic geometric series of some kind. In fact, I could say that the first one is 1 fifth over negative 3 plus x, and the other one is minus 1 fifth over 2 plus x. Or in other words, I could say this first one is 1 fifth. I might want to pull that negative 3 out. If I did, what's left would be a 1 minus a 1 third x. This other one, I could factor a 2 out in the bottom, which would leave 1 plus 1 half x. All right, notice this one already has the 1 minus r form I want. This one's got the plus, but we know we can fix that. Let's just change that plus 1 half x to a minus minus 1 half x. Okay, now, cleaning up a little bit, it looks like I have minus 1 15th over 1 minus 1 third x. Minus 
1 tenth over 1 minus minus 1 half x. And so basically what have we done here? We've taken a rational function that has this quadratic denominator. We've expanded into two partial fractions, both with linear denominators. They are definitely suitable for geometric series, very natural. So by doing a little manipulation, what I've got now is the difference of two geometric series. The first one would be n equals 0 to infinity negative 1 15th times negative 1 third x to the n minus the other series, which is n equals 0 to infinity 1 tenth times, and I just realized I made a mistake there. Uh, you should notice that should not be minus 1 third. Right here we're saying our r is 1 third x. Over here we're saying our r for this second series is minus 1 half x. So this part should be minus. Let's see, can we clean that up a little bit? Uh, this first one would be n equals 0 to infinity. Um, looks like it would be minus x to the n over 15 times 3 to the n minus the series n equals 0 to infinity. Uh, this other one should be minus 1 to the n x to the n over 10 times 2 to the n. All right, question. As I look at these two series I've built, which I did pretty organically, I didn't worry about what the center was, it's pretty clear that these are built as series centered at 0. In fact, both of them are centered at 0. Okay, if they're both centered at 0, then of course there are going to be corresponding like terms. When n is 0 in both of these series, these will both be x to the 0 terms, which means they would both be 1s. When n is 1 in both series, they will both be x to the first terms. Okay, so the question is, can I add or subtract two power series and have the resulting power series be a convergent power series? And the answer is yes, because we know both of these geometric series are convergent on the proper interval of convergence. In fact, what are the intervals of convergence for these two? Well, let's say that right now. Notice this first one. Uh, what was the r value? The r value was 1 third x. Okay, that means 1 third x would have to be less than 1 to guarantee convergence for this first series. You should notice that says absolute value of x is less than 3. And since we're centered at 0, that means we're talking about an open interval of convergence, negative 3 to 3. Okay, what about this second series? Well, the r value for that one was negative one-half x, we would need that r value to have an absolute value less than one to guarantee convergence. But that's really just the same thing as saying absolute value of x is less than two. That says that my open interval of convergence for that second series is the open interval negative two to two. All right, question. What did we say in the previous video about the interval of convergence on the sum or difference of two convergent series. We said that we would have to pick an interval that was the intersection of these two intervals. That way we're guaranteed that the combined interval is an interval on which both of these converge. I don't want just one of them to converge and the other one to diverge. If that was the case, then when I add the two, the result would be divergent. The interval, let's say the largest interval on which I'm guaranteed both of these series converge is obviously this interval. And so now I can say these two series can actually be subtracted and combined into one power series. And I'm guaranteed that power series will converge on the smaller interval, the negative 2 to 2. Okay, what does that series look like? Well, of course, it's as simple as it sounds. I'm just going to add these two things together. And notice, since these two match, I really have like terms. 
In fact, when I add them and group the like terms together, you're definitely going to have a minus 1 over 15 times 3 to the n minus a negative 1 to the n over 10 times 2 to the n x to the n. And what I'm emphasizing there the way I wrote that is this combination of the coefficients of these two series that we started with here and here, that thing that you're looking at in the brackets is actually the so-called c sub n. So that this really does look like a power series n equals 0 to infinity c sub n x to the n. It's just that our c sub n is sort of elaborate this time. Now, can this be simplified by getting a common denominator? Yes, I can even clean up this and call that plus negative 1 to the n plus 1. Uh, not that important at this point to simplify that any further, but uh, you should at least, uh, I think, take it this far where you're grouping these together to see clearly what that combined coefficient in this summation is. All right, so that's about as difficult as we're going to try and handle here, but obviously you're pulling out a lot of tools to do that. But again, it is another basic geometric series uh, with a little bit of partial fraction expansion and addition of two geometric series thrown in. Okay, which brings us to the last tool or technique I want to look at, which is multiplication of power series. Now let's suppose we have two power series. Let's say we have a series n equals 0 to infinity, let's say a sub n x to the n. So we'll make this centered at 0 just for convenience. And let's say we have another power series where the coefficients are b sub n's. And we've already said that as long as these two series are centered at the same value, we can certainly add and subtract them. And we know that if the two series we're starting with converge, we, we have a definite idea about a minimum interval on which the sum converges. It's the intersections of those two. Okay, we've also looked at an example where we've done long division. That can certainly be done with two power series, and we'll do that more in the next section. Uh, but we can also multiply power series. And to get an idea of what that looks like, let's just write out what these two series are. Um, if I was going to try and multiply this power series times the other power series uh, to get a feel for what that would be, let's just write out what that would look like in expanded form. The first series looks like an a sub 0 plus an a1x plus an a2x squared plus an a3x cubed plus dot dot dot. The other series looks like a b sub 0 plus a b1x plus a b2x squared plus a b3x cubed plus dot dot dot. Alright, so Let's do some distribution here, or if you prefer to think of it as FOIL. Uh, first thing I'm going to ask is, when I multiply these two infinite polynomials, let's just start from the basics. If I think about the possible degrees for the terms that I could get in this answer, uh, the first one would be constant term. And what's the only way to get a constant term out of this product? It's these two. And so the very first term in this product would be a0, b0, plus, all right, let me see if I can erase that and that. What are the ways that I could get first degree terms? Well, it would be if I took this constant times a first degree term over here. It would be if I took this first degree term times this constant over here. And notice that's as far as I can go because the next term is quadratic and I can't multiply that by anything over here and get a first degree result. Okay, that means I have two products in this infinite multiplication that get me first degree terms. One of them is going to be a0b1 
x, and the other is going to be a1b0x. So let's write that down. The yellow one gives me a0b1x, and the other one gives me, whoops, and the other one gives me a1b0x. And I'll just write it this way where I've grouped those two terms together and factored out that combined coefficient. Okay, let's do a little racing here. Okay, what's next? It should be, how do I get second degree terms? Well, it's the same process. How do I get a second degree term out of this? I'd have to multiply it by a second degree term over here. How, I, how do I get a second degree term out of this term? I'd have to multiply it by a first degree term. Is it possible to get a second degree term from this one? It is if I multiply by a zeroth degree or constant term over here. That means when I form those three products and combine them, I'm going to have what? Well, there'll be an A0, B2, that would be the yellow. There will be an A1, B1, that's the orange. And then there'll be an A3, or rather A2, B0, that's the green. That gets me the x squared terms. Let's do one more. I think you've got the pattern, but uh, just for emphasis, let's do one more. And you can uh, play along at home. So let's see, we want cubic terms. So shading them again, I would need him to go with a cubic term. I would need him to go with a quadratic term. I would need him to go with a first degree term. And I guess I would need him to go with a constant term. Uh, you should definitely be noticing some sort of pattern here. Well, there's lots of patterns, but I think the first one that sort of jumps out at you is that to get the first degree term, you needed two products. To get the second degree term, you needed three products. To get the third degree term, you're going to need four products. And of course, what are those products? It's going to be A0, B3, A1, B2, A2, B1, and then A3, B0. And I did this third one just to really emphasize the pattern because I think going to that third one really does let it show up a lot more clearly. All right, so this is clearly... Let's call it something C0 constant term plus something x, let's call it C1x, plus something x squared plus something x cubed, and so on. If I continue this process, where clearly we're saying C0 is just A0, B0. We're saying C1 is the combined coefficient on the x term, which is the a0, b1 plus a1, b0. The c2, which is the combined coefficient on the x squared term. That's the a0, b2 plus the a1, b1 plus the a2, b0. And then so on. Um, now down to, maybe we can extrapolate here in a minute and say, what the coefficient on the nth degree term in this product would be. Uh, but for starters, let's look at the, the form of these first three. Um, lots of patterns here, and it looks like the big one that, again, should be jumping out at you as you look at these three, is these two indices for each of these three terms add up to two. These two indices add up to one. These two indices add up to one. These two indices add up to zero. All right, which means if you look at that pattern, I'm going to start with the, the last one and work backwards. Could I say that this is a sum itself? That is, the coefficient on the second degree term in this infinite product is actually a little mini sum, and there's a pattern to it. 
it definitely looks like a summation k equals 0 to 2, where each of the a's, well, what does the a do there? It goes a0, a1, a2. And if in this little sum k was going from 0 to 2, that would be an ak. Meanwhile, what's the b doing? The b starts at 2 and then goes to 1 and then goes to 0. Okay, that wouldn't be b to the k. It would be the opposite. It would be b to the 2 minus k. That way, when k was 0, this would be b2. When k is 1, this would be b1. And when k is 2, this would be b0. Okay, does that pattern hold everywhere else? Well, this one would turn out to be what? Sum k equals 1 to 1. a sub k, b sub 1 minus k. Uh, what's this one? Well, this one here doesn't really fit the mold, at least not with the pattern we're thinking about on the other one. But if you buy what's happening with the pattern on these two, you should be able to tell me what the pattern generally is for c sub n when n is greater than 0. It looks like it should be k equals 0 to whatever the degree is which in this case would be n, times a sub k, where that a just cycles through a0, a1, a2, up to an. And then what would I get for the b factors? Well, it should be b sub n minus k. OK, let's put this all together. I think what we're saying is that when we multiply n equals 0 to infinity, a sub n x to the n times n equals 0 to infinity b sub n x to the n, we're going to get a new power series, which is going to be some c sub n x to the n, where each one of those c sub n's is determined by the formula sum k equals 0 to n a sub k b sub n minus k. And by the way, just in case I misled you there, uh, let me clarify one thing. Notice that this formula even works for 0. If n is 0, then this sum is k equals 0 to 0, a k b 0 minus k. And since k steps from 0 to 0, the only value of k that we ever attain is 0, which means we get a 0, b 0 as our single term in that sum. So this formula actually does give us a closed formula for generating each one of the coefficients in this series multiplication. Um, I won't write it down here, but if I know the interval of convergence for this series, and I know the interval of convergence for this series, then what is the interval of convergence for the combination of the two, which is this guy right here? It's the same principle as what we talked about for the interval of convergence for the sum of the two convergence series. It's the intersection of the two intervals of convergence for those two series. All right, for example, let's, let's see if we can apply this series multiplication to actually generate a power series for something. Let's look at the example of finding the power series for e to the x over 1 minus x. And I'll tell you what, let's actually do two questions here. Um, let's say a part um, x squared e to the x, and let's say b part um, e to the x over 1 minus x. Okay, the A part, I, I'm just throwing in a, an easy one like this just to show you how easy this really is. Okay, X squared is not representable by a power series other than just the term X squared. Remember, power series are extended polynomials, polynomials of infinite dimension. And X squared is already a polynomial term, so X squared doesn't really have an infinite series other than the infinite series that consists only of the term X squared. 
However, we know there is an infinite power series for e to the x. So what is x squared e to the x? We're saying it's just x squared times the power series for e to the x, which we know is n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. The key part is, since x squared doesn't have anything to do with n, that means as far as n is concerned, x squared is a constant. It can be moved in and out of the sum. If that's the case, notice this would become n equals 0 to infinity x squared times x to the n over n factorial. But isn't that just n equals 0 to infinity x to the n plus 2 over n factorial? And we're done. That is our power series. All right, now, you should notice that this second example is not quite that simple because I can't just take the power series for e to the x and just multiply by a simple polynomial like x squared. Why? Because if I'm viewing e to the x over 1 minus x as a multiplication of e to the x times 1 over 1 minus x, we already know that these are both power series. In particular, we know e to the x is n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. And we know 1 over 1 minus x is our basic geometric series, n equals 0 to infinity x to the n. Now, um, obviously, you can see, if you want to follow the formula I just laid out on the previous page explicitly, the first series that you see there is definitely a n equals 0 to infinity a sub n x to the n, where a sub n is 1 over n factorial. You can see that the second series is definitely an n equals 0 to infinity b sub n x to the n, where b sub n is actually 1. So if you go back and use the formula I just wrote on the previous page, uh, writing out that formula or using that formula with these series is pretty easy because your b sub n is always 1. So b sub 0 is 1, b sub 1 is 1, b sub 2 is 1. They're all 1. That means when I go back to this formula, um, that is this formula right here at the bottom, every one of these factors right here is always a 1, which means really anytime I want to figure out cn, I'm just summing up all of the k's, a k's, where k is less than or equal to n. All right, that's great. That means this should be an easy problem. However, what I want you to practice and get used to is not relying on that formula on the previous page. In fact, I wrote that formula more or less to demonstrate how this FOIL or infinite distribution process is working. You should really do these from scratch each time. Um, it helps you avoid mistakes and it gets you used to doing this long multiplication, which is something you will need to use in some other places. So what I mean by this is um, I'm going to actually write out a few terms, uh, at least four or five, in each of these series, and then I'm going to multiply them by hand to see what they look like. So for example, this first one is what? Well, we know that's just the series for e to the x, so starting at n equals 0, that would be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial. And that's probably further than I need to go. What's the other series? Well, that one's even simpler. The first one's x to the 0, which is 1. Then the next term is x, and then x squared, and then x cubed, and then x to the 4th, and then so on. Okay, so let's practice our long multiplication. And by that, I mean, what's the only way to multiply a term from the first series by a term from the second series and get a constant? It's only that combination right there. What's the only way to get a first degree term? 
Well, again, it has to be taking a constant here times a first degree here, or a first degree here times a constant degree or constant term there. And I can see clearly that's 1x plus 1x is 2x. Okay, now I'll stop highlighting everything, and I'll just say that to get the x squared term, I'm going to take 1 times x squared. I'm going to take x times x. I'm going to take x squared over 2 times 1, which will be x squared over 2, and that should give me 5x squared over 2. And that would be my next coefficient. And I'll just say that a typical question you're going to be asked in the homework, both from the book and online and perhaps on the test, is to write out the first three or four or five, let's say, non-zero terms in the power series for this function. And what I'm laying out for you is a straightforward way to do that. Figure out what the power series are for each of these functions. Write them out and write a certain number of terms. Multiply them together in the way that I'm doing here term by term until you've got the number of terms you need. And I already have the first three non-zero terms. Let's do one more just to uh, see one more term thrown in there. So how do I get the cubes? I would have to take 1 times x cubed. I would have to take x times x squared. I would take, have to take x squared over 2 times x. I would have to take x cubed over 6 times 1. Okay, of course, what is that? If you add all those up, this is going to be 12x cubed over 2 plus 3x cubed over 6 plus x cubed over 6, which means I get 16x cubed over 6, which means I get 8x cubed over 3. Plus dot dot dot. In other words, we're definitely talking about C0 being 1, C1 being 2, C2 being 5 halves, and C3 being 8 thirds. So if you see what I'm doing there, I'm actually writing down what are the coefficients of the terms of various degrees in this power series. And of course what I mean by C0 and C1 and C2 and C3 are respectively the coefficients of the constant term, first degree term, second degree term, third degree term. And this is something you'll be asked in the homework. Okay, so long division, I'm sorry, multiplication works pretty well. And I, a Freudian slip there, if you notice, uh, the reason I said long division is because if I were to take e to the x divided by 1 minus x, the other way I could look at that would be to, instead of multiply e to the x times 1 over 1 minus x, I could look at it simply as a division of the polynomial 1 minus x into e to the x. And of course, I know e to the x has a power series of 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6 plus x to the fourth over 24 and so on. Uh, so let's close with this example and let's just repeat one of these long divisions just to see it happening again. So of course I know 1 goes into 1 one time. 1 times 1 minus x is 1 minus x. Now, be careful here. Um, I didn't do this in the other example, but when I subtract that to get the remainder, which of course is 2x, I know that I'm going to continue this process indefinitely and that these powers and the remainders are going to get bigger and bigger. Realize this time I'm actually dividing into an infinite series that has a bunch of terms up there under the division bar. I should really carry those down here so that I don't forget about them because I'm going to need them here shortly. So let me carry down all of those and just trust me when I tell you that if you don't carry those down it's very easy to forget them. And you'll see, of course, here in a second that you need them. How much does 1 go into 2x? It goes 2x, of course. 
2x times 1 minus x would be 2x minus 2x squared. If I subtract, what's my remainder going to be in this column? Well, it's going to be 1 half x squared plus 2x squared, which is going to be 5 halves x squared. Let's bring down the next few terms from my original dividend. And now I repeat the process. How much does 1 go into 5 halves x squared? Of course, that's 5 halves x squared. 5 halves x squared times 1 minus x is 5 halves x squared minus 5 halves x cubed. And if I subtract those, of course, I'm going to get 1 6 x cubed plus 15 6 x cubed, which would be 16 6 x cubed, which is 8 thirds x cubed. And then, of course, 1 divides into 8 thirds x cubed, 8 thirds x cubed. And then, of course, I can continue this process indefinitely. But if you check with uh, the way we just did this a moment ago, I'm getting, again, exactly the same terms for this combination. But it does show you I can look at these combinations in different ways. I can certainly look at this as a product or a quotient. And in this case, it does turn out that the division, the quotient, approach is a little simpler, I suppose, because it just involves a polynomial divided into a power series. Whereas when I treated it as a multiplication, it was a product of two power series. Okay, both valid approaches and both useful in their own ways. Okay, so hopefully I've given you the, the tools and how to think about them with some good examples. So let me know if you have questions and we'll stop there.